So do you hear that? Do you hear what I hear? It's this, it's this dull roar, like a, a crowd of angry people coming our way. It's, it's really getting louder. You know, in my work, I talk to lots of students, recent graduates, and their parents. And beyond the fact that they did enjoy going to college, there is one thing that most of them will say is that they're pretty pissed. They're pissed because it was such an anxiety-ridden process to try to figure out this path from college to career. They're pissed because many of them feel underemployed or unemployed. When actually thousands upon thousands of recent graduates are unemployed, you can understand why they're angry. The bad news is they're actually angry at us. You know, when you interview a freshman before they come to college, what they'll tell you is one of the number one reasons why they think they're coming to college is to get a better job. Um, when we actually talk to those students uh, when they're high school seniors and we're in admissions and we're trying to convince them to come, what do we say? We say, you're going to come and get a great education. You're going to learn how to think creatively and critically. You're going to um, get a broader perspective, a global perspective. You're going to be able to think in such a way that will prepare you for life. In fact, what we sometimes say are these words is we're going to give you a holistic education where we'll help you lead rich lives filled with meaning and purpose. And that sounds fantastic. But to those students, what they're thinking is, I hope a good job comes with that too. And when it doesn't, they feel let down. So we're making promises that in some ways we're not really fulfilling. And so I can understand why they're angry. But we can do something about it. I think one of the things that we find ourselves in this world thinking is that our students are not capable of doing more than one thing. We find ourselves saying, they come to get an education, so that's what they're here for. That's all that they should do. And I think our students would beg to differ. They would say, I have friends. I can travel. I have all these clubs I'm involved with. I actually can multitask. In fact, I can multitask circles around most of the teachers and the faculty administrators in this room. So why can't you add the career question into that equation? Why do we say we won't let them do that? They're very confused. And honestly, given my background, I find I've always been confused too. But I think there's time to try to do something a little bit different. There's a couple, I should say, excuse me, there are three big trends that are actually continuing to get that big tidal wave more momentum. The first one is this. The world of work has been fundamentally transformed. We all know it. It looks nothing like it did before. The world is flat. There are fewer jobs. The competition is fierce. It is not only global. It's actually our students are competing against people who have been out in the workforce for 5, 10, or 15 years. So they're not only competing with other people who are 21, 22, 23 years. They're competing against 40 years old for the same jobs. They have no idea. On top of that, the employers have said, the knowledge and skills that students need to have to actually be competitive to get a job have ratcheted way up. And so they're actually looking, because they don't spend any much, any much money anymore on training, they're looking at the schools to say, you should be training them these things. And they should be able to, when they interview for jobs, be able to articulate, given what they've learned, why they will be great employees at this organization and why they're actually really committed to whatever it takes to be great. But if we actually never spend any time talking to our students about those questions, they have no idea that that's what they're supposed to be trying to do when they actually get into an interview. We need to help them make that transition and understand what's really expected. Second, there has been a huge proliferation in this notion that undergraduate pre-professional programs are the way to go. Now, students who are here at a liberal arts college might say, well, that's not us because we made that choice to come here. But if you go to a college where they have uh, undergraduate programs that compete right along with liberal arts college, I can tell you that on that kind of campus, and Wake Forest is a campus that's like that, there is a huge angst for those students who are actually not in the business program because they think that they're un unemployable. And there's a huge angst among all those students who actually go to these major research universities when they're seniors in high school deciding, I have to decide if I'm going to be an engineer or a business student 
before I even know what those are. And because of that, it's actually reducing then the demand and the interest in the liberal arts. And that's a problem. Third, the politicians are getting into the act. And that's usually not a good sign. <laughs> right? We've heard it. Uh, governors from major uh, states, Texas, North Carolina, Florida, in the last year have all basically bashed the liberal arts, saying that they're going to propose that we strongly consider reducing the amount of funding going to universities who have programs that have majors or disciplines that don't result in employability. Even when some of those governors were actually liberal arts majors themselves. They've drunk some new Kool-Aid and now they're saying it's not time to actually invest in what actually I got out of it. That's sort of scary. President Obama's getting into the act. He's created this college scorecard. In principle, it sounds like a really good concept to try to help people make good decisions. But if you actually get into it, some of the data and what will come out for how people are going to make those decisions will actually really harm the value and the perceived value of the liberal arts. So we can either stand and watch it happen to us, or we can actually move into it and try to do something about it. That's something for us all to think about. Now, if we actually get to our own campuses and we think about this actual student experience, here's some challenges. First, most students, most students will say, you know, when I really look back at my experience of being at college, I really didn't start thinking about the whole job thing until January of my senior year. Because my parents basically made it clear to me I couldn't come home. I needed to go get a job. And I didn't really know, I sort of knew that, but I actually wasn't going to do anything about it. So I sort of put it off. That's not right. Right? That, that we have four years with them. We should be working with them with that whole time, not just assuming they'll figure it out whenever they figure it out, because there's lots of other important things for them that get in the way of it. The other problem is that there are students who will say, well, I'm actually not going to engage in this process until I actually figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. Well, the problem with that is that they may never actually figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up, so they'll never even start looking for a job. And that's a real problem, is that they, people don't realize that this process is one that you have to enter into to actually start to answer those questions. But students don't know that, so they actually, I've heard many of them say, I actually don't go use the career office because I'm going to wait till I figure out what it is that I want to do. They could be waiting for a long time. And then they're stuck at the end with nothing. So that's another issue that is a real big problem on our campuses. So the solution? career services must die. And when I use that phrase, career services, the idea behind it is that the brand of career services communicates something to everyone. Words matter. And when you have a service, there's an idea that a student has in their mind. I've talked to them. I've asked. And they've said, well, I thought when I went to the office that I, with this 45-minute appointment that I have with this counselor, that they would say, after I talked to them about what I'm interested in, which I wasn't really sure what I was interested in anyway, but they would come back and say, you should do this, because if you do this, you'll be happy for the rest of your life. And that didn't happen. <laughs> and then they said, but I also thought they would either give me a bunch of contacts who would just have jobs, or ones where they just said, I have a bunch of jobs open that are just like what you want. Here you go. And that's not going to happen either. We know that. And so as a result, you can imagine a student says, wait, that didn't go the way that I wanted. And I'm going to make sure I tell all my classmates how bad it was. And when the faculty asked me, how's that career office going, they'd say, they, they stink. They aren't helpful because they didn't give me what I want. Because I, I thought it was going to be easy. I thought it was going to be fast. Sort of like the way I applied to college, right? The way I applied to college, I just filled out a form, send it in. People said yes and no, and then I'm in. That doesn't, that's not the way the job market works. But that's what students are thinking. Because it's the only other time they really applied for something that had that type of importance to them. We have to teach them the way it actually really works. So the words matter. The second thing is that when you think about the idea of services is that it does set a certain expectation. And in this world, everyone wants things fast. They want it really easy. The other piece that I would also say is that this process is actually a process of development and growth and learning. The idea of trying to understand what your career is about starts with who are you in terms of your interests, your values, your strengths, your personality your beliefs, the things you, what matter to you, and what, what do you care about. And that takes time to think about and to reflect and figure out. Students need to have time to go through that process, and they need to be told that's important. And at the same time, they have to figure out how does that connect into the world, and they need to be given opportunities and ways and encouragement to actually go out into the world and figure that out and talk to people about that and try things. And with that, they can come back 
and forth and back and forth and slowly the picture will start to really be created. But we don't ever really tell students that and they, we just think they'll just figure it out on their own. But that's not career services, that is career development. And for me, what we call it is personal and career development because you're starting first with the person. If we get too focused on the career side, we're always focused on what do I do, how do I get the job, how do I get out there, and let me get it. But we actually have to start with, let's start with who are you, and why are you, and what really matters to you. And keep asking yourself those questions, and then you'll start to figure it out. So we've done this at Wake Forest. We have killed career services. In the beginning, it's sort of scary, because you think people won't know what this is, because you've gotten rid of the words that people have used for decades. But it's amazing how fast, especially you guys know, here in a higher education institution, you get rid of one thing after the first year, everyone was throwing their arms up, and the second year, no one even remembers what it was. <laughs> so it's not that hard. So we have an Office of Personal Career Development. And in this office, we've gone from a little seven-person career team to seven teams, 30 people, and we basically supersize our career office. And everything we do, it always starts with who are you as a person, what do you care about, and then let's figure out how that relates to your career or your professional development. So of these different organizations that are teams that are in my, in my office, everyone's run by a director. There's someone who oversees career education and counseling, because there's that educational process. There's a second one, which is about employer relations, because you actually have to build relationships with employers, not to bring them all to campus, but to be able to get students to connect with them of all different types. And we actually do that in partnership with our business school. So we've broken the boundaries of saying the business school has its own operation and the college has its own operation. We said, let's find a way to share the employer relations piece so that all students can get access to all employers. And that when you ask, ask employers, what they will say is that I want the best student. I don't want the best only business student. I want the best student who's interested in business. That's powerful. We have a mentoring resource center. We are trying to teach students how to be really great mentees, to look to adults throughout their lives for help and assistance. We're looking to try to teach faculty how to be effective mentors and advisors. And we conduct over, um, we get over 2,000 faculty and students in trainings each year to talk about what does it mean to be an effective mentor or mentee. We have leadership development, which actually is run in an academic sense, not just in a programmatic sense. We have a family business center because we have lots of students who their parents actually run family businesses and one of the angst that they've run into is do I go back to my family business and how do I navigate that? And then we have a center for innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. And that particular center is very, very powerful because we have many, many students who in the college are thinking how do I actually get exposure to entrepreneurship and innovation in such a way where I don't have to be a business student. We have a minor called Entrepreneurship and Social Enterprise. It's the number one minor in the college. And it is one where each year there are 300 students who are actually in that minor. And there are hundreds, over $100,000 each year we're giving away to students to either work in entrepreneurial ventures or start entrepreneurial ventures. But we're not actually interested in creating ventures. We're actually interested in creating entrepreneurs and innovators. Because we know that in the 21st century, the number one thing that all of our students need to have is a mindset as an innovator, a creative person, as an entrepreneur. And the students actually need to experience that. One of the big ways that I think about how this all works, though, is it's not about the size of my office and students all going through our office. It's actually about empowering the community. And so we really work with the faculty to help them be part of this solution. We have gone to a point where we capture the data of all our students and their outcomes by major. We share those outcomes to all of our students, and, what, and we actually share them to all of our faculty. So our faculty, for example, in history, what they do is they go, where have all my recent students gone to? And as you look at that, you see they've gone to a variety of different areas. So then when they hold the Why Major in History forum, we actually help them market it. We, um, we get, instead of the, the academic group marketing themselves, when only five students will show up, 50 students show up because we're marketing it and we're also telling them, hear about five different alumni who are going to totally different areas in history. Using their history, but going into whether it be um, to medicine, to law, to teaching, to writing, whatever it might be, you can go into a lot of different places. But students don't know that. They need to see and they need to hear those stories. And so that partnership is very powerful. So we have every single faculty department across the, across the college who are either holding at least two career-related functions with us in partnership, and some of them hold as many as five. Because what the faculty have started to realize is that this is really helpful because my students aren't so worried that by majoring in you name it, it's not going to be a dead end. Because that's what the world is telling them. 
and they're not so sure. They're not sure how to make those connections. And so we actually are a partner with them. I actually look at my office and think, more than anything, I'd rather have us be like an Intel chip inside a big computer where you don't even know that the chip is inside, which is our office, but we're behind the scenes making this whole thing happen. We actually have, when I think about it, the university is a network. It's a network of great people who all want to help each other. And one of the things that we have to do is activate that network. So we actually have over 6,000 people on a specialized group within LinkedIn where the faculty, alumni, and parents and employers have gone in and said, if students contact me, I will be responsive. So if you're a student who's in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and you want to work in Los Angeles to, in the media business, you can contact that person. They can actually talk to you. And more often than not, it turns into an internship opportunity. But you can't actually expect the career office or the school to go out to LA and bring LA employers to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That's not going to ever happen. But you got to turn it the other way and empower the students and give them the ability to network and get out there. Because they can do it. They, they've been doing it their whole lives with Facebook and things like that. So that's one of those things that we're doing is you got to think about how do we use technology in a positive way to activate this network and the power of it. We know it works. How do we know it works? This past year, 2012, we get 80% of our students to answer the survey to tell us where they go. 95% of them are either in graduate school or in a job by six months after graduation. The difference between the college students and the, and the business students is, is a couple percentage points. So that data helps because now what it says is we can actually talk, to, we can tell the students to tell their parents, it's okay if I major in philosophy because the students in philosophy all got jobs and went to graduate school just like the kids did in the business school. But without that data, the students don't have that power so they don't know what to say and the parent pressure is high. We have to help them, we have to get the data. We also know it's working because we shared this vision with parents to come in and parents alone and parents of alumni have given our office over $10 million in three years. And there's more coming. And I don't think it'll ever stop because this is so, such a big deal on parents' minds. And so the, the thing that we always hold ourselves back in terms of thinking is that we're not gonna be able to do it because there aren't enough resources, but they're there. We have we've had over 100 schools come to visit or call us to ask us how we're doing it and they're all starting to innovate themselves. And so we're hoping that you'll think the same. But one thing I tell all of those schools is that if the faculty and the senior administration aren't willing, open, and can't get committed to do this over the long haul, it's really not worth it. Because it has to be something where the culture says this is so important that what's so mission critical for these students and their parents will be mission critical for the school. So to get there, let's kill career services and let's embrace personal career development. And we can create the solutions that will keep that wave that's coming to crash down on us at bay, and we'll survive. Thank you.